Catholics have been putting their faith into action for 75 years in the Diocese of Joliet, and we have a lot to celebrate. This podcast episode is one of a 14-part series being produced for our 75th anniversary. I'm Justin Reyes, one of the co-hosts for the season, and I lead the Department of Catechesis and Evangelization. And I'm Michelle Dellinger, the Director of Communications. Together, we'll interview a wide variety of clergy, religious, and parishioners across the diocese. We're so happy you're here with us. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to the sixth episode of the Faith into Action podcast for our 75th anniversary. It's always a gift to spend time with priests, and today I get to hang out with two pastors in the diocese. So first, I want to welcome Father Sonny Castillo, who currently is the pastor at Mary Queen of Heaven in Elmhurst. Welcome, Father. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's good to be here. And I'm also here joined by Father Matt Lamoureux, who is pastor at St. Patrick in Yorkville. So yes. welcome to you as well. Thank you. And also current administrator of St. Mary's in Plano. So hi to you guys, too. He's a very busy man. So yeah. thank you for your time today. Today we're going to be discussing the shrines in the diocese. We actually have four within our diocese. And so... We're going to go over details on uh, those locations. But first, before that, I want to make sure everybody has a really good understanding of what a shrine is and, and why they could be important to our faith life. So, Father Sonny, can you tell us exactly what a shrine is and what us as faithful Catholics, we should know about practicing veneration or pilgrimages to them? Yes, thank you. Um, shrines are everywhere, everywhere in churches throughout the world. And its shrines are no, not only Catholic, there are also shrines that are pagan in nature and shrines that are considered national shrines or maybe shrines that are uh, shrines of nations and things like that. So the word shrine itself comes from a Latin word, um, scrinium, which means a small container or box which contains valuable things that are revered. Uh, so when we you just even just use that etymology, we realize that shrines are um, places or venues, um, locations that have been set apart as places where um, respect, value, veneration uh, is, is, is done. Uh, recognizing the people behind them. It could be a person who is considered a hero. It could be a, a saint. It could be uh, even your own family member. So it's possible for me to enshrine my mother in a little corner of our house or in her <laughs> garden, you know. Or if your beloved husband, for example, uh, you want she, he wants you to be enshrined in his heart, for example. And then you are <laughs> so that's the idea, right? right? But in the Catholic Church, when we say shrine, it takes on a more official sense because the shrine is designated, particularly the official national shrines. They're, the four in our diocese are designated. A bishop designates a certain place as worthy of veneration of a specific saint, maybe because a miracle has taken place there, or maybe a relic, a very important relic is found in that place. So even just with that te technical term um, in the Catholic Church, you know it's something important because it reminds us of the importance of the communion of saints, which of course we proclaim every Sunday uh, when we profess our faith. Um, I think one of, one of the important things about going to these places is that we, we realize the value of the person that we venerate in those places, particularly the saints. Um, we go to the shrine of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Fatima or Lourdes, for example, to recognize her healing intercessions. That one time she appeared to those uh, shepherds in Fatima and, and we saw her desire for world peace, for example. So those are things that we uphold as a church. And we go there to unify ourselves and join ourselves in the in the value or the or the virtue that's associated with those apparitions and miracles so in a sense because of that pilgrimage just makes sense like we are encouraged john paul ii uh, pope benedict the 16th 
my, many of our bishops encourage us to go on those pilgrimages to visit shrines in the world to be able to mimic our our journey in this world uh, to the kingdom of God. So it's like a microcosmic journey of the macrocosmic journey of the entire church. So we're all together here. And it's beautiful because it, it unites us with all the others who are joining us in these pilgrimages, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a unitive act of faith. And because it's so important, when we go on these pilgrimages, we focus on the spiritual life, we focus on conversion, we focus on um, maybe uh, a, a certain type of prayer request that we have, a healing. Maybe we bring with us the healing um, request of people who would, who would pray for. There's a lot of value to going on those pilgrimages. And as we go from one shrine to another, um, there is that sort of presumption that um, we are also growing in our spirituality as we express our faith in this journey. It's so important in the Catholic Church that um, even a partial or plenary indulgence may be associated to them. In other words, for example, the Pope uh, on, on a year of a jubilee year, for example, in Rome, he might say, if you uh, visited uh, Rome on the, on the year of hope, which is happening next year, by the way, um, you will receive a plenary indulgence if you walk through all the Santa Portas of Rome, for example, right? So the, the Pope might designate even that level of spiritual gain that uh, we receive a plenary indulgence if we if we did some of these visits to these different shrines. Mm. So there's a lot of spiritual value to it. There can be even physical value to it because sometimes healing takes place there. Uh, it, 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 it's spiritual in nature, so therefore we can sometimes receive spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit through these visits to the shrines. I have visited so many shrines. I've, I've done over 20 pilgrimages in my, in my time as a priest so far, 20 years as a priest. And it, every single pilgrimage has been filled with absolute you know, beauty, lots of spiritual gifts that overflow. I myself have seen miracles happening. Even for me, I've experienced miracles, small miracles, but good miracles mm -hmm. in these journeys. I have so much story to tell about going to these pilgrimages. And I just feel like with our diocese having four places that you can go on pilgrimage, you don't have to always go to Rome to have a pilgrimage. You can go to the, one of these four shrines and uh, it will have some value. Sure. Yeah. What a beautiful explanation. Thank, Thank you. you. And, you know, you're leading us into our next question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Father Matt, can you tell us about some experiences that you have witnessed in your visits to shrines and um, just, yeah. you know, either here locally or at shrines in other areas? Right, right. Well, I, I grew up in the Philadelphia area, so that's where my parents, my sisters are still at. And um, so I would go to the shrine of St. John Newman, who is the Bishop of Philly there, and uh, St. Catherine Drexel. And I remember that being important for me and for my family. That that influenced us. I remember uh, my sister Janae; she was trying to get a job, and my my so we went to the to her tomb, St. Catherine Drexel, and my mom called my sister up on the cell phone, and and put, put uh, the cell phone on the tomb of St. Catherine Drexel. I don't totally recommend this, but and and. Uh, <laughs> um, and and so then she got a job within like a week or, or, or something like that. But anyway, so, so that's the influence for me growing up there. And then my devotion to Mary was increasing. And I, I, I sent some information to, uh, to the shrine in Chicagoland area, which I had never been out to Chicago, a place called Marytown in Libertyville. Um, and so that was influential, my devotion to Our, to our Lady. And I, I, I went to, to Medjugorje a couple of times. It's not a, a officially approved yet, but it's approved as a shrine. You go, go there on, on pilgrimage. And so it seemed like that was having a big impact on my vocation. And eventually I joined the, um, not the Diocese of, of Philadelphia, but the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And so we have the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Mass. And so we, we promote the Divine Mercy devotion. And so when I joined the Marians, you know, that's our provincial house. And so just being there and experiencing like the people who come from long ways away on, on bus, on pilgrimage, you know, may sacrifice. Um, especially on Divine Mercy Sunday, we had like 20,000 people that come for Divine Mercy Sunday. And, and it's an amazing experience. But people are, 
in search, especially when they go to shrines of, uh, you know, they're making a sacrifice or doing a pilgrimage and, they, and they, they want a particular grace or especially in search of mercy. And so especially when you can have confession at a shrine, that's, that's a, key, uh, a key way to grow in the faith. And so, um, uh, yeah, that's, so that's just some of my experiences at, at shrines. And then, of course, we'll talk a little bit more about the um, uh, shrines here in, uh, in the diocese. And, and uh, um, okay, I, I really want to talk about St. Jana, but I'll, I'll hold off for now. <laughs> <laughs> we will get there, I promise. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, not everyone can go to Lourdes or Medjugorje, mm -hmm. um, but we have four unique opportunities within our diocese. So, Father Sonny, let's start our discussion of the local shrines um, with the oldest, which is St. Anne's in St. Anne, Illinois. Uh, that's in the Kankakee area, and you've been there. St. Anne is, of course, the mother of the Virgin Mary, and we celebrate her feast day on July 26th. So what can you tell us about the St. Anne Shrine? I was privileged to be the pastor of uh, St. John Paul II and the three other churches in the Kankakee area in my nine years over there. And so I was very, very close to going to St. To Saint Anne, Illinois. And uh, every year they would celebrate the Feast of St. Anne there. It's on July 20, 26, 26 yep. July 26. And uh, there are a lot of people that go to the shrine of St. Anne. And... Uh, my first time to go there, I was sort of curious what they do. Um, I've been to, you know, obviously the Shrine of St. Anne in the Holy Land. <laughs> and uh, I've also recently visited the Shrine of St. Anne in, uh, mm. in Canada, in Quebec. And so um, I had a lot of suspicions, like, or maybe questions about, like, what do they do here in this particular shrine? The Shrine of St. Anne uh, came to be, uh, to the awareness of the public um, when... Um, when a certain 22-year-old um, lady from Chicago, um, her name was Matilda um, uh, Matilda Gagnea of I'll Chicago. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll believe you. <laughs> Matilda, yeah. Matilda Ann Gagnea. Um, she 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 went to to that to the church uh, in Saint Anne in 1904, and. Uh, she, she came with a wheelchair that was made of wood and rattan. So it's kind of like, not that not this fancy wheelchair we have today. But she went in there with this wooden um, wheelchair. And she came out of there, miraculously hmm. healed of uh, her affliction. affliction. Uh, she was able to walk. Um, and she all, there was also, um, I think if you go to the Church of St. Anne today, that particular wheelchair is still there. Yeah, it's on display. Uh, it's on display together with a couple of canes, as some other canes that belong to Matilda are there. It, everybody heard about this miraculous healing that took place, and then people started going to the church um, in, in busloads and busloads. They say that um, thousands of people would go there on the Feast of St. Anne and participate in the nine-day novena. There would always be a healing mass that happened outside of the church, because they couldn't contain the number of people anymore inside the church. So they would do an outdoor Mass. And until today, uh, with Father Peter Jankowski there now, they still do an outdoor Mass. I would, um, a lot of priests in that area uh, who are Viatorians um, really started this and really nourished, nurtured it through the years. Now, yeah. it's very interesting because Viatorians have been in, in, in this area for so long, even before the Diocese of Joliet was created. That yeah. used to be part of the Archdiocese of Chicago. So in, in that time, there was a Viatorian priest by the name of uh, Father Charles Chiniki that um, actually acquired this relic of St. Anne, the bone of St. Anne. So this is not just any relic. This is like first class, super first class relic. You know? <laughs> so apparently that particular bone of St. Anne traveled from France to St. Anne de Beaupre. And it was Father Chiniki okay. that acquired it from Canada and brought it to that part of the world, that part of the diocese. Well, interesting because that part of the diocese is known to have had many Canadians that became a place where Canadians came from, you know, from Canada. They they settled in that part of the diocese by the river. Mm -hmm. So even today we know when you go to Kankakee, that, that area, that there are, that, that, that used to be a lot of Canadians. So there were a lot of French-speaking people in that part of the diocese. Um, and imagine what, what happened just with the bone. Um the church was established in, in 1872. So it was about three decades before it came to become really popular. And it was named as 
the first national shrine of the United States hmm. because it's very early on like that. Right. When you go today, I think through the years, the number of people have dwindled, although there are a lot of efforts to continue to revive it and to pr promote it um, everywhere. But I think uh, today when you go, you'd still feel the sense of devotion of the people when you, when you go to the day of the, of the novena and the, there is a procession that happens around the town and they process the, the bone, the, the relic of St. Anna, a big kind of a reliquary. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's, people still go there even today. Just the numbers have dwindled through the years, but still they are faithfully doing exactly what they did back in the, in the early 1900s. Nice. Very neat tradition. Thank you for sharing yeah. that with us. Of course. So next, um, we'll talk about a Marian shrine located in Lombard, Illinois. So Father Matt, uh, at St. Pius X, there's the National Shrine of Mary Immaculate, Queen of the Universe. Right. And this shrine is celebrating its 50th anniversary in May, and there's a little bit of history there. So um, what should we know about this location? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so remember the Assumption of Mary uh, was dogma uh, in 1950, so that's proclaimed. And then um, uh, Pius XII on, in 54 uh, started the, um, well, the, the uh, August, August 22nd with the Queenship of Mary. And so... After that happened, um, here in the diocese at uh, St. Pius X Parish, uh, they, uh, they started with uh, uh, Bishop Blanchett's approval, a, uh, a shrine dedicated, I want to make sure I get the name right, um, uh, Our Lady uh, as Queen, uh, Mary Immaculate, right, Mike, and that... The title, right? I want to make sure. Mary Immaculate, I, you will believe it. Queen of the Universe. Trust. Mary Immaculate, Queen of the Universe. Okay, yes. I, I recently found out about this, so I'm, and I'm looking forward to uh, to visiting there. But it was started as devotion to Mary, especially as Queen and and as Mother. So the idea was to enthrone Mary as Queen in your heart and in your home, and enthrone her as Queen there and uh, so that uh, really developed I, th I, I believe the bishop approved that in 74 so it's it's been a beautiful devotion in which people can can grow in their, in their devotion to our lady as as queen and um and there's an image attached to this as well it's spread across the world especially through france and different parts of the world and um me as a marian of the mac exception i definitely approve of it and uh, so i think it's a great way to uh, to increase our devotion to, to sure. Mary and her Immaculate Conception. And if you're watching on YouTube, we'll, you know, there's images of each of these shrines that we'll put up for you. And my understanding is that um, Marian statue that is shown, that is in the co back corner of the church. So yeah. it's a permanent and it can always be visited. And the parish is planning a 50th anniversary celebration in May of 2024. Um, the details aren't quite finalized yet, but um, the website is, you know, listed and we'll always include these things in the show notes. So yeah. keep checking. There might be a special day in May that they'll um, they'll host an event there. So thanks, Father yeah. Matt. OK, Father Sonny, next up is the National Shrine and Museum of St. Therese in Darien, which is the largest mm, shrine yeah. in the diocese. And um, you're a man of few words. I know you have nothing to say <laughs> about it. Right. Um, uh. So, and, and this shrine is served and supported by the Society of the Little Flower. Mm -hmm. um, I actually visited on October 1st, the feast mm -hmm. day of St. Therese, and I hadn't been there in years. Um, right. Long ago, I went as a chaperone, uh, with one of my kids' field trips, and this past October when I went, I was really impressed with how much they've expanded, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's a much larger campus now, and there's so many, there's museum quality rooms and displays, so... Father Sonny, you've led pilgrimages there. Um, so talk to us about yeah. what, what visitors will find in Darien. Um, there's so much there that, that you can find because yeah. it's also the headquarters of uh, the province, the province, of the, the province uh, of the Carmelites here in this yeah. part of the world. Um, but I think if when you look at this particular shrine, you cannot just you can feel the spirit of Saint Therese. There's a lot of uh, beauty that's there. Um, I think I think one of the things that you need to really see immediately is um, to go to the church that is that is dedicated to Saint Therese. Uh, there is a sort of a glass um, a wall behind the sanctuary 
and it's the image of Saint Therese with flowers all over it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, uh, and it's it, it brings a lot of light into the into the into the sacred space. Um, so I mean, they, they celebrate masses there Monday to Friday at eleven thirty. I know that because I brought some seminarians there not too long ago <laughs> to okay. have to have mass there uh, on the shrine. Um, but what what's interesting about the shrine is it's not just the actual building itself and the actual you know etched image of the of Saint Therese that's beautiful. Surrounding the shrine, um, there are a lot of statuaries all over the place now. Too, if you go all the way to the back of the church by the lake, they would find statues of, for example, the parents of Saint Therese, um, Louis and Zelie. Martin, mm -hmm. uh, they would be right, right there. You know, you find a statue of the infant Jesus of Prague. There is the Stations of the Cross. There's so many beautiful statues there that you'd see, and again, it encourages you and it really inspires you about just kind of thinking about the communion of saints that we're all part of. Um, so it's a beautiful place. But when you go to the gift shop, um, to, the, to the what used to be where the chapel was. Uh, before they built this beautiful big uh, church. Uh, in that area that used to be the chapel, it's now fully a museum of Saint of Saint Therese. Um, in that museum, you'll find some really beautiful points of interest. You'll find first-class relics of Saint Therese and also her parents. Um, you'll find pictures of Saint Therese in different stages of her life. Since mm -hmm. she was a child, you'd see what she cute girl she looked like as a child all the way to when she was a nun. You'll find um, also some some paintings, uh, works of art associated to the veneration of Saint Therese. And a wood carving. Wood carving. I remember it was there beautiful. There is that huge wood carving on the yeah. wall that was, that was that's been there forever, um, and that's the one that depicts all the different stages of the life of Therese. Mm -hmm. Also, but to me, one of the most moving things that I've seen there is uh, the the replica of the cell of Saint Therese. In 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 in, uh, in France, so she she was a nun in Lisieux, the the Carmelite monastery in Lisieux, which by the way I've also been there. <laughs> I've been to Lisieux. Um, I love Therese. Who doesn't yes. love her? You know, um, beloved but, saint. Yeah, beloved saint. She, she the the actual uh, cell of Saint Therese in Lisieux was replicated. And you would see it there. So exactly. meaning her bedroom, right? Yes, Where she lived in the convent. Little nook, you know, corner. Yeah. There's a small little corner in the convent. Yeah. And uh, and I saw the one item that, that really moved me because I saw this when I'm you know being there in, in Lisieux. I also have been have visited her house, her family house in Le Bosonnet in France in, in Lisieux. Now you're just showing off. Yes. No, <laughs> yes, yes, too, because I'm so yes. proud that I yes. managed to get there. But 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 there is a statue there. That you can also find at the shrine. The statue that's unique of the Blessed Virgin Mary, it's a smiling Mary, our Lady of the Smile, which was connected to the to the conversion, really, to the conversion of Saint Therese. And it's some miraculous experience that Therese had with, with this particular white statue that's mm -hmm. called Our Lady of the Smile. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, beautiful. Go and see it. It's amazing. It's that we have the shrine of Saint Therese in the Diocese of Joliet. It's like one of our greatest trophies because it's amazing. Right. Therese is beloved, not only yeah. in our diocese, not only in this part of the world, it's worldwide. The, the, the cult or the, the, the reverence of Saint Therese is one of one that has taken over the world, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, yeah. just a note there, like um, when I was assigned out here to uh, Plano and Yorkville, um, never been to Chicago land area back in 2006. And, you know, it's a big change. And But I remembered, oh, isn't there a shrine to Therese in that area in Darien? And uh, because uh, I would consider Therese to be my favorite saint. Uh, don't tell St. Gianna. But, I was but, like, so, wait a minute. So, I mean, you know, because <laughs> uh, she really helped me in, in seminary. But um, that was a sign to me that, you know, this is God's will for me to come to this area. But, yeah, St. Therese is always close to my heart. Absolutely. Beautiful. Oh, very cute stories. Yes. Well, and, you know, I feel like we've had this French theme going on for the first three with the Canadian <laughs> influence and um, and St. Therese in actual France. Now we're going to shift a little bit to Italy. Mm. And Father, <laughs> Father Matt um, is going to talk about 
the newest shrine in the diocese and the yeah. only diocesan approved shrine. Um, you know, uh, Bishop Hicks just released the decree. Yes. And so, uh, Father Matt, you have personally put a lot of time and effort into the establishment of this shrine. So can you tell us that story and about yeah. your relationship with the yeah. family even? Right, right. Yes, it's, it's, it's yeah, please tell me when to stop talking. But so <laughs> it's amazing how it's developed. Um, when I came out to uh, play on Yorkville and then Pastor St. Pat's summer 2009, um, I, I, I wanted a positive uh, pro-life shrine and um, something that was life-giving. And I already had devotion to St. Gianna. Uh, there was a St. Gianna shrine in Philadelphia area, um, kind of like the same thing as... Um, uh, the one here on um, Mary Immaculate, Queen of the Universe, in, in the corner of a church. And I remember hearing her daughter speak, her f uh, family members speak. I'm like, that's pretty neat. We have a saint that her family is still alive. We have home videos of her. She's Italian. My mom's Italian, so, you know, that connection there. Um, she's a wife, mother, and a doctor. Uh, all, all, all that was like coming to place there. So when I, I said, okay, let's do a positive pro-life shrine. Maybe let's have a picture of her in the church because at this point we were still in debt because we have a nice new church in 2002, but we're still paying down in debt. And like, okay, we, you know, we can't spend any money on, on a shrine right now. Um, but like, that's okay. And then like uh, the, the parishioners and Knights of Columbus are like, well, let's do a statue. Like, okay, well, uh, we'll do a statue inside and it can't be too expensive. Well, let's do something outside. Like, well, you know, I, I don't know if we can do outside. And, uh, but then, this is okay. a community effort. Right, right. Yeah, so a uh, faith too. So, okay. And um, what happened? Let's do it on our property in which it could, it could expand. Like, okay, remember, we're in debt. We can't, <laughs> do, do, you know, do all this stuff. But, um, but then if we're going to do a statue here, it can't be a cheesy statue, right? Because we've seen, seen plenty of nice meeting statues of saints or pictures that are nice efforts, but doesn't really get at who they are. So I'm like, it has to be beautiful. So we found a statue in Canada, and the artist agreed to do another version of it. So it's with Canada St. John. again. Right, right. It's coming up, eh? <laughs> and uh, so so, so then um, uh, he agreed to do it, and and it's, it's Gianna with, with her kids in a picnic setting because they grew up, like, went to picnics in the Alps. And uh, so... Like, yeah, that's that's unique. Let's do it. We had a person who built the pavilion. Um, we have storyboards out there now of our life. It's a rosary walk. The signs walk. are really pretty and yeah. professional. Yeah, yeah. So we, you know, that tell that each aspect of her life, wife, mother, doctor, her, her, her vocation. And, you know, we have like um, uh, bricks people could do in honor of, of a loved one. So it just kind of ballooned, and no no funds from the parish. All funds from parishioners who private donations, who private donations, or from people in the state and in the in the country. Um, and so it's it's been a great effort. And and her daughter came uh, to visit back in 2013 or so, and she gave a talk. and And we just received great news that she's coming again uh, to speak at St. Pat's and also Holy Family, I believe on 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 May 25th, I think it is. And uh, so. Um, yeah, and then, and then we did hear the uh, uh, the news from the bishop just a couple weeks ago that it is an official shrine of the diocese. Congratulations! So, so yeah, that, uh, our God. first diocesan shrine. Amazing! So. Praise the Lord! Yeah. Thanks be to God. And yeah. and we really wanted to be a and, and I think the bishop really lends his support of this because he wants a positive pro life shrine that's life giving, um, that that helps people at all areas in their life, especially if they've lost a child through. Um, through death, abortion, or or just loss of a loved one, or through a miscarriage. A lot of times, those who have miscarriages are often forgotten, or you know they're not giving the permission to grieve and 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 to um, uh, you know the loss of the child. And a little known fact is that uh, Saint Gianna, she had two miscarriages after um, her third a child, and so her and Pietro had to go through that loss as well. And so. Um, we have a hope box, and so when uh, someone is in contact with us, we find out that they've had a miscarriage. We're able to give them a, a hope box, uh, box that contains um, prayers, different things that gives them encouragement and uh, um, help for them, and, and it's been really healing, healing, healing time for them. So, so yeah, we we you know we just want to have this as a positive pro-life, also pro-family, you know, and uh, 
her and Pietro had a, a strong marriage. And, um, and we hope, and, and it's Gianna Manuela, her hope, the daughter of St. Gianna, who she gave her life for, it's her hope that her father will also be a saint one day. So they're looking at mm -hmm. his cause as well. So. Her um, holy family is just an incredible story. Um, and we do have some more details on that on our website because she is coming to the diocese in May. That's a public event. Um, so for more information on that, you can all visit our diocesan website at diojoliet.org. And we have an event section um, and in fact, this podcast is coming out in April. So I just want to point out, you know, four events that we have coming in April. Finding Grace in Your Marriage is a new support group for parents of those with disabilities. Um, so that's a ministry that is starting up in the diocese. We have information about the March for Life Illinois, which is in April. The first of our three Theology on Tap events, our series for 2024 is coming in April. And then also Jeremiah Day, uh, which is at Mundelein, and that's for boys in grades seven to 10. So information on that and the St. Gianna event in May are all on our website, so please visit. Um, and that's all the time we have for today. So please go and visit one of our diocesan shrines, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month when Justin is back talking. Uh, of course, the month of May is going to be focused on the Virgin Mary, so tune in next month, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the 75th anniversary edition of the Faith into Action podcast from the Diocese of Joliet, recorded here in our studios at the Blanchett Catholic Center. New episodes are released on YouTube and podcast platforms the first Monday of each month. Please remember to subscribe and share the good news of Jesus Christ. May God bless you and yours.